Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Abdul Nasser Jangda. If you enjoy and benefit from listening to our podcast, please donate to Qalam by visiting supportqalam.com. We love being able to share this content for free with you, and your donation ensures that we are always able to do so. Each podcast we produce has tens of thousands of listeners. So the opportunity for gaining immense reward by supporting this effort is endless, insha'Allah. You never know who will be able to benefit from your contributions and donations. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Siratul Nabawiyya, the prophetic biography. In the previous session, we started talking about the illness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fell ill during the last week of his life, about a week before his departure from this world. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became very ill and we talked about throughout that week uh, what was the condition of the Prophet ﷺ, what were his interactions with the people around him, with his family, what were some of the conversations that occurred, <coughs> excuse me, what were the, some of the conversations that occurred during that time, and just, you know, what overall was going on. And we talked about some of the more significant parts. Of course, everything is significant, but we talked about a couple of things that we particularly highlighted. And one of the key things being that during that week that the Prophet ﷺ was not well and he physically became ill, the Prophet ﷺ was unable eventually, a couple of days into the illness, to be able to physically go and lead the prayer. And during that time, the Prophet ﷺ specifically identified Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the very beloved and trusted companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He appointed him to lead the prayer in his absence due to illness. And we talked about that quite a bit. What we're going to talk about today is, I, there were a couple of things that I wanted to mention that are also from that general period, those days leading up to the last couple of days of the life of the Prophet Wasallam, And after mentioning those couple of things, then we'll talk about the Sunday. Uh, and of course, Monday is the day the Prophet Wasallam passed away. We'll see how far we're able to get. But Sunday, there is there are two particular moments on the day of Sunday, the day before he passes away, that um, need to be highlighted. But prior to getting to that, prior to discussing that, there were a couple of things uh, a couple of more very important, significant things that I wanted to mention here. The first one is that there's a very interesting conversation that Ka'ab bin Malik, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ka'ab bin Malik is a young Madinan, a young Ansari companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who uh, was also a poet. Uh, he was a young man of the community of Medina and a very beloved companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, his name is very familiar to us from a couple of different places. He was one of the people on uh, at the occasion of Al-Aqaba, that basically at the season of Hajj before the Hijrah, when uh, the year before the Prophet ﷺ made the Hijrah, made the migration, there was uh, a group, uh, a large group that had come from Medina as representatives and they had essentially come to make the proposal that they wanted to request the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims to migrate to their home, their city. It was called Yathrib at that time, Medina thereafter, and basically reside there and they wanted to support the mission from there. And Ka'ab bin Malik was amongst that group. And not only was he amongst that group, but he is noted as being one of the in, one of the key people who stepped up to give the oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ at the area of Mina, where a masjid is established that is present actually remarkably till today, known as Masjid al-Bay'ah or Masjid al-Aqaba. 
So his name occurs there. A second place where his name, of course, is notable. Uh, many other places, he did participate in many things. But another incident from the life of the Prophet ﷺ where his name is familiar from is in the Battle of Tabuk. He was, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا Amongst those three companions who had stayed back without any valid excuse, but they were genuine, sincere believers. When the Prophet ﷺ returned back from Tabuk, they basically fessed up and they told the Prophet ﷺ, we do not have a legitimate reason for which we stayed back, and therefore we admit that we are at fault. And ultimately there was a time of solitude, a time of quiet reflection and um, isolation that they were, uh, that, that was basically given to them almost as a punishment. Uh, and as a retribution to be able to reflect on what exactly had transpired. So he was one of those three people. That's where we know his name from. Nevertheless, moving on to the actual incident now. During that week, in the middle of the week, while the Prophet ﷺ was very physically ill, Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that Abdullah bin Mas'ud, uh, excuse me, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, who is a family member of the Prophet ﷺ, and being a family member of the Prophet ﷺ, he particularly had a lot of access to the Prophet ﷺ even during that time when he was bed, when he was in bed, when he was sick and he could not get out of bed. So he, Abdullah bin Abbas tells Ka'b bin Malik that Ali bin Abi Talib, who also very close beloved family member of the Prophet ﷺ, trusted confidant, that Ali bin Abi Talib was there visiting the Prophet ﷺ and had been spending some time with him. Ali bin Abi Talib came out of the home of Aisha after spending some time with the Prophet ﷺ. When he came out, Abdullah bin Abbas met him and he asked him that, Ya Abul Hasan, that was the kunniya, kind of the, the, the name with which Ali radiallahu would be addressed as a gesture of respect, O oh, father of Hassan. Ya Abul Hassan. He said, Kayfa asbaha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How is the Messenger of God this morning? Faqala asbaha bihamdillahi bari an. He said, Alhamdulillah, by the grace and mercy of God, he looks a lot better today. Faakhada biyadihi Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. And he says that Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and also the uncle of Ali, he said he took Ali by the hand. It's a very tender moment, it's a very touching moment. Ali radiallahu was raised by the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a sense of, and again, you know, anyone who's been in this particular position can relate to this, Someone very beloved to you is very, very sick and very ill. Any, you know, if, if you're, if you the day before, maybe they were not able to talk at all, then you go visit them the next day and they're able to talk to you a little bit. You're looking for any hope. You're looking for a glimmer of hope. And so they're able to talk to you a little bit the next day. What do you say? Oh, he's doing great. You should have seen him. It was like the old times. I thought he was gonna jump out of bed. You know, you're looking for any semblance of hope. This person is so beloved to you. You can't imagine the world without this person. Abbas, he's an elder, a lot of life experience. He's watched many people pass away. He's lost many people in his lifetime. He's wise. He recognizes that Ali is speaking more from a place of kind of hope and emotion rather than really assessing what the physical condition of the Prophet ﷺ is. So he doesn't just say something to him. He takes Ali by the hand. فَأَخَذَ بِيَدِهِ عَبَّاسُ بْنُ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ He took Ali's hand, held his hand. And then he said to him, أَنْتَ وَاللَّهِ بَعْدَ ثَلَاثٍ عَبْدُ الْعَصَى أَنْتَ وَاللَّهِ بَعْدَ ثَلَاثٍ عَبْدُ الْعَصَى he uses a euphemism. The, the ancient Arabs, and this is generally a sign of culture and sophistication, all right? And also, uh, it can also be a very important part of being appropriate and being um, well-spoken and understanding the situation. So he uses an, a euphemism, an expression. He says, you, I swear to God, wallahi, you, after three days are going to find a lot more responsibility on your shoulders. 
Abdullah Asa. The Asa is a staff, and the staff is kind of the sign of a shepherd having responsibility. That's why the Prophet ﷺ would use that analogy where he said, "Kullukum ra'in." Each and every single one of you is a shepherd. وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسُولٌ عَمْ عِيَّتِي And all of you will be asked about, will be responsible, accountable for your responsibilities. And then he goes on to elaborate that a father is responsible over his children. And so on and so forth. So he says, I swear to God, he says, you in about three days are going to find a lot more responsibility on your shoulders. وَإِنِّي وَاللَّهِ لَأَرَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم سوف يتوفى. مِنْ وَجْعِهِ هَذَا He says that I swear to God, Ali, from where what I see, I see that the Prophet ﷺ is probably going to pass away in this illness. He will not recover from this. إِنِّي لَا عَرِفُ وُجُوهَ بَنِي عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ عِنْدَ الْمَوْتِ He says, I have seen many of our family members come and go. The children of Abdul Muttalib. I've seen my brothers die. And I've seen their faces and what they look like towards the end of their life. And he says that he, Muhammad wasallam, the Messenger of God, he's got that look that I've seen before on the faces of my brothers when they are near their end. So it's a very powerful moment. The second thing that I wanted to mention that transpires during this week that is a very profound moment. Um, and admittedly, even though I am not going to get into the full scope of the controversy here, but nevertheless, a lot of times, this particular moment is the subject of some discussion and controversy. It's found in multiple narrations of Sahih Bukhari and even Sahih Muslim, narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He says that يَوْمُ الْخَمِيسُ وَمَا يَوْمُ الْخَمِيسُ He says that Thursday, the Prophet ﷺ had become sick on a Monday or Sunday night. And so about more than halfway through that week, once the Prophet ﷺ was physically no longer capable of going out there and leading the prayer, Abdullah bin Abbas reflecting back says that Thursday, that was a Thursday. I'll never forget. Meaning, that was the toughest week of our lives. Watching the Prophet ﷺ so ill. اشتدَّ رسول الله صلى الله The sickness and the pain of the Prophet ﷺ had become much more severe. فقال إئتوني أكتب لكم كتابا He said, bring to me some parchment, something to write on, so I may dictate something to you. لَن تَظِلُّوا بَعْدَهُ أَبَدًا So that you will never lose your way. You as an ummah will never lose your way. فَتَنَازَعُوا People started kind of arguing and debating. Kind of a conversation started, turned into a bit of a discussion, turned into a little bit of a debate. وَلَا يَنْبَغِي عِنْدَ نَبِيٍ تَنَازَعُوا Abdullah ibn Abbas says, and it is not appropriate to argue in the presence of the Messenger ﷺ. So finally, when after debating with each other and everybody kind of cross-talking with each other while the Prophet ﷺ is there, they فَذَهَبُوا يَرُدُّونَ anhu. They basically kind of turned their attention back to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, دَعُونِي Leave me. Let me rest. Leave me. Go. فَالَّذِي أَنَا فِيهِ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا تَدْعُونِي إِلَيْهِ He said, the condition that I'm in, what I'm headed to is better than what you are trying to pull me into. These discussions and debates, is not something I have time for, or tolerance of. In another narration, there's a little bit more, um, you know, kind of, uh, some more details are added, or we're able to kind of understand the situation a little bit more. It's also from the narration of Bukhari, and also in the narration of Muslim, also narrated by Abdullah bin Abbas. He says, لَمَّا حُضِّرَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى وَفِي الْبَيْتِ رِجَالٌ The Prophet ﷺ was sick, he was ill. There were some of his family members and other men, some people, some sahaba were gathered together in his home, sitting around him. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ kind of woke up. 
He had kind of a, a lucid moment while he was so sick and in and out of sleep and fever and things like that. So he kind of woke up. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ هَلُمُ أَكْتُبُ لَكُمْ كِتَابًا لَا تَضِلُّ بَعْدَهُ Allow me to dictate something to you so that you do not, you're not misguided or lost afterward, after that. فَقَالَ بَعْدُهُمْ Some said, إِنَّ الرَّسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَدْ غَلَبَهُ الْوَجْعُ وَعِنْدَكُمْ الْقُرْآنُ حَسْمُنَا كِتَابُ اللَّهُ They said, the Prophet ﷺ is in so much pain. He's fading in and out of consciousness. He can barely muster the strength to speak. We have the Qur'an. He delivered to us the Qur'an. The Qur'an is sufficient. فَاخْتَلَفَ أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ وَاخْتَصَمُوا So then all of a sudden, some discussion and debate started occurring. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ قَرِّبُوا يَكْتُبْ لَكُمْ كِتَابٍ لَا تَضِلُ بَعْدَهُ Some started to say, no, 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 go get something and ask him, press him to tell us, and we will write it down. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ غَيْرَ ذَلِكُ Some others were saying, leave him. Why are you causing all this commotion and upsetting him, disturbing him? فَلَمَّا أَكْثَرُ اللَّغْوَةَ وَالْإِخْتِلَافَةَ Then when a lot of cross-talk and kind of like, you know, kind of some debate started occurring. قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قُومُ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, please go. Stand up, leave. And Ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنهما, he says, إِنَّ الزَّرِي إِنَّ الرَّزِيَّةِ كُلَّ الرَّزِيَّةِ مَا حَالَ بَيْنَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بَيْنَ أَنْ يُكْتَبْ لَهُمْ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابَ لِإِخْتِلَافِهِمْ وَلِغَلَّتِهِ Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he would say later on that I have no doubt about the fact that the thing that came between the Prophet ﷺ and him giving some parting advice was the fact that they started debating and discussing and cross-talking and not doing you know, what was appropriate in the presence of the Messenger ﷺ. That came in between that. And we definitely see that in other places as well. Um, in the seerah, in the life, in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, where again, one of the most prominent examples of that is of course, Laylatul Qadr. Then in authentic narration we find that the Prophet ﷺ was coming out to inform the companions and the believers about when the night of power Laylatul Qadr exactly precisely is. And when he came out, there was some argument that was occurring amongst the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to them, he said, I came out here to tell you about when exactly the night of power in Laylatul Qadr is. However, because of the argument that y'all were engaged in, because of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed that knowledge from me, and now I cannot inform you. And from that point on forward, of course the Prophet ﷺ told us, it is during the last 10 nights of the month of Ramadan. But we do find, and of course ultimately what we know, the way we, we understand that and reconcile that is, that was ultimately the plan of Allah. The plan of Allah there was that we would not know the exact night of Laylatul Qadr. The plan of Allah here was that the Prophet ﷺ would not further add anything to what He had already given us from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. But the process through which we arrive at that particular end, there's wisdom and a lesson within that. It was more so that whole scenario occurs to teach us a lesson. It did not change the end result, it is to teach us a lesson. And the lesson that we learn is we have to be very mindful that a lot of times our own, you know, kind of enthusiasm, Sometimes it comes from a good place. Our enthusiasm, our energy, our curiosity, right? Our opinions, so on and so forth, get the best of us. And sometimes cause us to engage in the behavior that is not exactly ideal. And so it's a little bit of a warning about that, that while all these things, curiosity, having, a, having thoughts and opinions and ideas, <coughs> and, and being enthusiastic. All these are good things. But they are all good in moderation. And there's a time and a place for everything. And you have to be very careful and mindful of that. Wallahu ta'ala alam bisawah. So what this brings us to now is a conversation about the day of Sunday. 
Now the reason why I particularly fixate on the day of Sunday is, as we talked about, the Prophet ﷺ fell ill on that Monday. For the first couple of days, Monday, Tuesday, the Prophet ﷺ still had enough energy. He was definitely sick. It was hard for him. But he had enough energy where he was able to sit up a couple of companions, people of his household, Ali bin Abi Talib, Fadl bin Abbas. These people would basically come, they would lift him up, he would put his arms around their shoulders, they would help him go for the prayer, and he would lead the prayer, and he would even sat and led the prayer when necessary. But then, after a couple of days of that condition, eventually the Prophet ﷺ was no longer physically even able to sit up and go out there, even with assistance and help. So then the Prophet ﷺ commanded Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to lead the believers in prayer. And that now carried on for the next few days. Right, we can assume kind of the next few days of like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And that brings us to the day of Sunday. On the day of Sunday, the narrations mentioned, the history books, the hadith books, the sirah books, they all mention that on that Sunday, some of the narrations actually identified that it was the Dhuhr prayer. Some mentioned that it was the Dhuhr prayer. Wallahu ta'ala alam bisawab, Allah knows best. But nevertheless, it was the day of Sunday. And the Prophet ﷺ, a little while before the time of the prayer, he asked Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, I want you to go get Hafsa, one of the other mothers of the believers, another wife of the Prophet ﷺ, who is the daughter of Umar bin al-Khattab. Hafsa bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He said, go get Hafsa because you're going to require some help, some assistance. She says, I went and I got Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. After we were both there, the Prophet ﷺ told us, he instructed us to go and fill sab'u qirab. Sab'u qirab. Qirab, the plural of qirab, basically refers to a water skin. So what they would have is that they would have this thing made out of like tanned hide, and it would be like a sack, a water sack, a water skin, they refer to it. And it's used for storing and carrying water. So it's kind of like what we would call a bucket. All right, the closest analogy I, I can give is that it's like a bucket. So he told them, go get seven buckets of water. And then he said, that come back, and when they came with the seven buckets, he said, pour those seven buckets of water on me. So he said, we proceeded to pour the seven buckets of water on him. And after we poured that, the Prophet ﷺ was able to sit up. And he hadn't been able to do that for a couple of days now. So it was almost like he got a second wind. So he sat up, we then helped him, you know, change into some dry, clean clothes. And then the Prophet ﷺ said that, send for someone to come and help me to the masjid. During this time, because the last few days, Abu Bakr ta'ala who had been leading the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ was not able to come out and join them for the prayer. The prayer had started during this time. They went and they got a couple of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They came, they again kind of lifted up the Prophet ﷺ with their assistance. They took him to the masjid. The prayer had started by now. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was leading the prayer. Now, as I had explained before, and if you visit the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ today, this is something you're able to see, that if the Prophet ﷺ was leading the prayer from here, the door to the apartment, to the home of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was directly adjacent. It was like right to the side of from where he would lead the prayer. So there was a curtain hanging there. When they brought the Prophet ﷺ out into the masjid and the curtain moved, it was noticeable that there's some movement on that side. And as you can imagine, everyone's heart has just been kind of like attached to that spot right there. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, how's he doing? Is he gonna come join us again? 
So as soon as they saw some movement on that side, you know, everyone's praying, but you kind of sense there's some movement there. And naturally you understand that the only movement from there can be the Prophet has come. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, and they started bringing the Prophet sallallahu to where Abu Bakr was leading the prayer from. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala leading the prayer, realizing that they're coming, he started to step backwards. He started to move backwards. Of course, vacating the musalla, the place of the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet sallallahu gestured with his hand. And stuck his arm out and he gestured in a way so that Abu Bakr could see kind of from the side of his eye, Makanak. He gestured to him, stay, stay your place. Meaning you keep leading them in prayer. And then the Prophet ﷺ asked the companions to come and sit him next to where Abu Bakr anhu was. And then the Prophet ﷺ prayed as well and they completed the prayer. Now there's a little bit of a detailed discussion amongst the scholars, particularly from a point of view of fiqh, who was kind of leading the prayer. Allah knows best, it's a unique circumstance. But what many scholars have interpreted, and that would be very humbly my understanding of it, uh, and that is the Prophet ﷺ telling Abu Bakr to stay in his place, seems to allude to the idea that he told Abu Bakr, you're still leading them in prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ came and prayed next to him, joining into that prayer. Wallahu ta'ala alam Allah knows best. Ultimately, the prayer was done. After the prayer was done, the Prophet ﷺ asked for their help to seat him on the mimbar, the pulpit, from where he would give the khutbah. He asked them to seat him there. The Prophet ﷺ was seated there on the pulpit, on the khutbah, uh, on the minbar where he would give khutbah from. And then the Prophet wasallam he praised and glorified God. بعد حمد الله والثناء عليه He praised and glorified God. وذكر أصحاب أحد And then the Prophet wasallam mentioned the people who had lost their lives in the battle of Uhud. He mentioned them, prayed for them, made dua for them, re- remembering, recognizing, commemorating their sacrifice. And he made dua for them. And then the Prophet ﷺ made his comments. He said, Ya ma'ashar al muhajirin. He said, O oh, community of the muhajirin, those who came to Medina from Mecca. He said, "Innakum asbahtum tazidun." He said that you will find yourselves growing in prominence. You will find yourself rising up. People will lift you up to the position of leadership. "Innakum asbahtum tazidun." Wal ansar ala hayati hala tazidun. The ansar shall remain very valued members of the ummah and the community, and will remain the hospitality, uh, you know, the hospitality team of the ummah, the caretakers of Medina, who welcome people here to the city of the Prophet ﷺ. But they shall remain that, but that is what they will remain. That is their role. That is the role they will continue to play. What, but he says, it's very beautiful. He says, وَإِنَّهُمْ عَيْبَتِي أَلَّتِي أَوَيْتُ إِلَيْهَا He says, however, never forget that the Ansar, they are my people. They are my people whom I came and sought refuge with. The Ansar are my refuge. Never forget that. And he says, فَأَكْرِمُوا كَرِيمَهُمْ وَتَجَاوَزُوا عَنْ مُسِيئِهِمْ If they are good, be good to them. And if they are bad, forgive them. He said about the Ansar, if they are good, be good to them, honor them. And if they make a mistake, they do something wrong, تَجَاوَزُوا Overlook it, forgive them. Because 
They gave me a home. They gave me a place. They took me in. In this last public address of the Prophet ﷺ, he kept that promise that he made so long ago. And he said, I will come with you. And I will stay with you. When Mecca was conquered, Mecca entered into the fold of Islam, Fajr Mecca, the opening of Mecca. At that time, the Ansar worried. What about us now? The Prophet ﷺ told them at that time, people today will take home things and you will take home the Messenger of God. He was born a Meccan, but he died a Medina. And rests and resides in Medina till today. And so even in this last moment, he remembered his Ansar and he talked about them. <clears throat> then the Prophet ﷺ said, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ قَدْ خَيَّرَهُ اللَّهُ بَيْنَ الدُّنْيَا وَبَيْنَ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ He said, there is a slave from the slaves of God, the servant of God, the slave of Allah. God gave him, Allah gave him the choice between the world and going back to Allah. He said this, and Abu Bakr radiallahu Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he started to cry. He started to cry, like immediately just broke down. And he cried, so he said, بَلْ نَحْنُ نَفْدِيكَ بِأَنفُسِنَا وَأَبْنَائِنَا وَأَمْوَالِنَا We would sacrifice ourselves for you. We would sacrifice our children for you. We would sacrifice, we would we leave all of our wealth for you. And he started crying, and crying like sobbing, weeping, like a child cries. So severely that the Prophet ﷺ actually told him, "Ala rislika ya Abu Bakr, pull yourself together, Abu Bakr. No, Shh, don't do this. Pull yourself together." Crying so severely. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said something. He said, "Umvuru ila hathi ila abwab ashari afil masjidi fashuduha." He said, "You see all these doors of people's homes that open up into the masjid." He said, "Close all of them. It is not appropriate for the sanctity of the mosque. Close these doors. The masjid is not your backyard. It's not a courtyard." Close these doors. إِلَّا مَا كَانَ مِنْ بَيْتِ أَبِي بَكْرِ Except for the door that opens from Abu Bakr's home. فَإِنِي لَا أَعْلَمُ أَحَدٍ عِنْدِي أَفْضَلْ فِي الصُحْبَةِ مِنْهُ He said, there was no one who provided me greater companionship than Abu Bakr did. No one provided me greater companionship than Abu Bakr. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِنَّا أَمَنَّ النَّاسِ عَلَيَّ فِي صُحْبَتِهِ وَمَالِهِ أَبُو بَكْرِ He said, the person who has done the greatest, the human being, who has done the greatest amount of favors to me, through his good companionship and through his wealth, is Abu Bakr. وَلَوْ كُنْتُ مُتَّخِذًا خَلِيلًا غَيْرَ رَبِّي لَتَّخَدْتُ أَبَا بَكْرٍ Had I... Were I to take a best friend, Khalil is like a best, best friend. Were I to take anyone as a best friend other than my Lord Allah, it would have been Abu Bakr. وَلَكِنْ خُلَّةُ الْإِسْلَامِ وَمُوَدَّتُهُ But he is my friend in Islam. And I love him for the sake of Allah. لَا يَبْقَى فِي الْمَسْجِدِ بَابٌ إِلَّا سُدَّةٌ all these doors that open up into the masjid need to be closed. Illa Baba Abi Bakr. Except for the door of Abu Bakr. And even till today, just a little side note, um, the brothers for men, when we go to say salam to the Prophet. If you if you come through the Rawdah, 
Of course, that's different. If you go through the Rauda, the old original masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, the Rauda in Riyadh al-Jannah, right? If you go through there, then of course you come out, then you make a left and you walk, and then you give your salam to the Prophet ﷺ. Facing the opposite direction of the Qibla, turning your back to the Qibla, then you're facing towards the Prophet ﷺ, his resting place, and you give salam to him. But if you did not come through the Rauda, through the masjid and make a left, if you are coming to say salam to him in Masjid Nabawi as it is constructed today, you enter in from that gate all the way at the end. And you walk that whole route, that whole pathway at the front of the masjid. That door that you walk through is called Babu Salam. That door that you walk through is called Babu Salam. Before you walk through into that door, if you were to stand in front of that door, to the left of that door, there's a door and that's called Babu Abi Bakr. Babu Abi Bakr. The door of Abu Bakr. If you walk into that door, that area that's right there in front, and usually they, that area you'll see a lot of people kind of praying there, sitting there. There's some little, you know, coolers with zamzam water there. Okay. If you walk into that door, that area, that door, that area inside that door, that is the home of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. That is the home. You are standing where the home of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala used to be. And if you actually even then turn around from the inside and look above that door on the inside, you see this inscription that has been there for hundreds of years. And it says, هَذِهِ خَوْخَةُ Abi Bakr. That this is basically the home, the apartment of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala So that's what the Prophet ﷺ was referring to. And this was that uh, particular moment. And that word khawkha basically comes from another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he used that word, where he said, Suddu anni kulla khawkhatin fil masjidi, um, ghayra khawkhati Abu Bakr. Close all these apartments that open up into the masjid, except for the apartment, the door of uh, Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And then the khawkha kind of refers to almost like a back door. Like, you know, sometimes the back door is a little bit more smaller and kind of indiscreet. It's a little bit more discreet, excuse me. So the back door oftentimes tends to be a little bit smaller, a little bit more discreet than a big front, fancy front door. So that's why that, those kinds of back doors are called khawkha. So that's what that refers to. So this was that moment that the Prophet wasallam came out to the ummah. He had this particular address, this conversation. And then the Prophet ﷺ, after having this conversation, the Prophet ﷺ retreated, he went back to his home, the apartment of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And from that point on forward, and again I want to explain this very quickly, just because a lot of times, sometimes people have trouble grasping this. In, in retrospect, reading all of this, talking about all of this, of course we know the Prophet ﷺ passes away. But even kind of reading what's going on during this week and his condition, it kind of occurs to you, how was it not obvious that the Prophet ﷺ was passing away? But you don't know that until you know that, until it occurs, number one. You don't know someone's gonna die until they die. Number one. Number two is, I talked about this previously as well, when you really love someone, you, it's hard to accept the idea that they're leaving me. It's very difficult. Easier said than done. But after that conversation the Prophet ﷺ had from the minbar, it became very clear to everyone that the Prophet ﷺ is truly departing. There's a narration in the Sahihain, in both Bukhari and Muslim, that later that evening, later that evening, the family of the Prophet ﷺ gathered around him. The family gathered around him. It was kind of, you know, everyone else was told to kind of give them some space. Let the family of the Prophet ﷺ spend some time with him. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha narrates 
that the whole family was gathered there. The wives of the Prophet ﷺ, the mothers of the believers were sitting immediately around him. Everyone was in tears. It was very quiet, a very somber mood. And the Prophet ﷺ was advising them that do not wail and mourn. Like don't, don't be very outlandish and mourning me and wailing and things like that. He was reminding them that's not appropriate. But he was lying there and he was very, his condition was very bad. While he was lying there, she says that Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she came to the door. She arrived at the home at the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. <clears throat> this might be known to many people, but just for everyone's benefit. The Prophet ﷺ was blessed with seven children in his lifetime. He was given, gifted, as the Qur'an uses the word, gifted seven children during his lifetime. Four daughters and three sons. Six of those children, the four daughters and the first two sons, were from Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha, our mother Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet ﷺ whom he was married to for 25 years. The last of his sons was born later to Maria Qitliya. But the interesting thing is this, and I, and I might have mentioned this previously in you know, a previous session a while back, but I'll reiterate, reiterate it here because it's so important. Six of the seven children of the Prophet ﷺ, the total seven children that he had, six of his seven children passed away during his lifetime. The Prophet ﷺ lived through the death of six of his children. And <clears throat> I don't think I need to elaborate on that too much. But just again, for the sake of just a reminder to myself and to anyone else. Unless the only one who can really speak to what it's like to lose a child is someone who's lost a child. But from what we see and what we know and what we're told by people who have lived through the passing and the death of a child, it is the most excruciating, painful thing that any human being can experience. It is the most heartbreaking thing that any human being can ever live through. It is tragic. You know, <clears throat> a particular thought and idea that I was reflecting on was that sometimes in some languages we have words for people who have suffered different kinds of losses. A child who has lost his parents, as tragic as that is, is called an orphan. A husband who's lost, a wife who's lost her husband is called a widow. A husband who's lost his wife is called a widower. We don't have a word for a parent who's lost their child. Think about it. In our, at least colloquially, in our speech, in the language we use to talk and speak, we don't have a word we use casually, normally, for a parent who's lost a child. And the, the first thing that occurred to me was, because maybe it's just too terrible of a thing to give a name to. It's the unspeakable. So we dare not have a name. <clears throat> but something else that someone told me. Someone, a parent who lost a child, who, held, who had held their child in their arms, and lost their child, <clears throat> they told me something remarkably profound. They said that the reason why there's no word for a parent who's lost a child is because you never stop being a parent. 
you never stop being a parent. A father who's lost their child is always, will always be a father. A mother particularly who's lost a child is always a mother. Because that child never leaves your heart. It's unspeakable, it's unbearable, it's unthinkable. But your child never leaves you. It's something you live with for the rest of your life. You just get better at living with it, but it never goes away. And the Prophet ﷺ lived through that six times in one lifetime. Just thinking about it breaks your heart. Just thinking about it breaks your heart. One of the takeaways that I have personally for myself, and I'll share it with you here. One of the takeaways that I have from this is that, you know, sometimes when you're going through something <clears throat> and someone gives you advice, I get injured and someone says to me, it's okay, it's okay, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It's fine. It's not that bad. What do I say to that person? Oh yeah, it's not that bad for you. Easy for you to say. Have you ever broken your arm? And if the person says no, then I'm like, then what do you know? What do you mean tell me? It'll be fine, it'll be fine. How do you know? You never broke your arm before. If I have surgery, and after, afterwards I'm sitting there lying and writhing in pain, somebody comes in and be like, it'll be fine, it'll be okay. Did you, did, have you had heart surgery? No. What are you talking about then? Where do you get off telling me it'll be fine? It's okay, it's not that bad. What do you mean it's not that bad? You don't know. And a lot of times, and this is not the appropriate response, but I'm, we're all human beings, so I'm speaking from a human point of view. If I'm dealing with some tragedy, some difficulty, some adversity, and someone says to me, be patient. Allah is with you. Don't worry. Allah will reward you. Allah is with you. Be patient. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Ista'inu bi sabri wa salah. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Sometimes, it's not the appropriate response, but I'm speaking as a human being, as a faulty human being. Sometimes, some people, we might think, or some people might even say, easy for you to say. Where do you get off? Patient. Be patient. Have you been through what I'm going through? And there's something so remarkable that the Prophet ﷺ, when he tells us be patient, when he tells us Allah is with you, when he tells us don't lose hope, when he says everything will be okay, Allah will take care of you, Allah is with you, Allah will reward you. When the Prophet ﷺ says, I never doubt that man. Never doubt that man. Never doubt. Never take his words lightly. This man suffered uh, something that is worse than death six times in one lifetime. If you ask any parent who lost their child, they would have told you dying before that would have been easier. I would have preferred that. Than having to see the empty bed of my child the next day. He dealt with that six times. When he says be patient, when he says it's okay, when he says hang in there, you listen. I tell myself, I remind myself, you listen very carefully. He knows what he's talking about. He knows pain. So anyways, six of his children died during his lifetime. The only child of his who survived him was his youngest daughter, Fatima Az-Zahra radiallahu ta'ala anha, the apple of his eye. Fatima tu bud'atu minni. He said, Fatima is part, a part of me. Man aadaha faqad aadani. Whoever causes her pain, causes me pain. She's a part of me, she's my Fatima. It's so much love for her. So 
Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, the family of the Prophet was gathered around him, the wives of the Prophet were there, and Fatima came at the door. And it's almost like on cue, like he could sense her presence. He was lying there with his eyes closed in pain. But when Fatima came at the door, it's like he could sense her presence. He opened his eyes, he looked at her, and he said, Marhaban bi ibnati. Marhaban bi ibnati. Welcome, welcome to my daughter. Come here, baby girl. Come here, my daughter. Come here, my beloved. He welcomed her, he called her to him. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says something so remarkable, it's so beautiful, it's so touching. She says, مَا تُخْتِئُوا مِشْيَتَهَا مِشْيَتَ أَبِيهَا When Fatima walked, you could tell that she was the daughter of the Prophet She walked like her dad. She t- in other narrations mentioned, she even had a lot of the facial features of the Prophet She looked like the Prophet She would walk like the Prophet She talked like the Prophet The Prophet would talk with his hands. The Hadith Shemayal mentions, he would talk with his hands. He would use his hands and he would talk with his hands. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha used to speak the same way. So she just comments very beautifully, Aisha does, radiallahu ta'ala anha, that Fatima, Sayyida Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, when you saw her walk, you knew that she was the daughter of the Prophet. فَأَقْعَدَهَا عَنْ يَمِينِهِ He asked her to come sit right next to him. He asked her to come sit right next to him. She sat down next to him, and she said, Wa karaba abata. Wa karaba abata. Why does my father suffer so much? Oh, the suffering of my father. Seeing her father, the Prophet ﷺ, in physical pain, she said, Oh, my father. He said, La karaba ala abiki ba'd al There will be no suffering for your father after today. Then the Prophet Fabakat. He called her close. He whispered something in her ear. Right. Put his, she put her ear down to his mouth. He whispered something in her ear, and she started to cry profusely. Then he called her close and she put his she put her ear down to his mouth again. And he once again whispered something in her ear, فَضَحِكَتْ And she smiled through her tears. Then she sat for some time. She bid farewell to her father, her beloved father, the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she left. And that was the last time they met in this world. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, says, فَلَمَّا تُوفِيَ After the Prophet ﷺ had passed and some time had gone by, the events of, you know, in the aftermath of the passing of the Prophet ﷺ had passed. She said that, I went to Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha and I asked her, can you please tell me what the Prophet ﷺ said to you? Because it was fascinating. Just watching it. What did he say to you? So she says, in the, f- the first time he whispered in my ear that made me cry so profusely. He said, Inna Jibreel kana yu'aruduni bil Quran fi kulli sanatin marra. Wa innahu aradani fi hadal ami marratain. Wa la ara dalika illa li ikhtirabi ajli. Fattaqillaha. Wasbiri. Fani'ma salafu ana laka. The Prophet ﷺ said to her, he said, Jibreel used to come every Ramadan and go through whatever had been revealed to me once, all the way through. This past Ramadan, he made me go through all of it twice. And I recognize that this is because my, the end of my time is near. So he said, daughter, please be mindful of Allah. Hold on to your relationship with Allah. 
and be patient for what is to come. Because no one has lost anyone better than whom you are about to lose. Meaning you are the, you're the best. So, she basically says, as I had mentioned previously as well, what she's mentioning here is that, again, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, having such love for the Prophet ﷺ, it was beyond difficult for her to accept that she was gonna lose her father. She lost her mother, she lost her sisters. She's lost so many people. It's so hard for her to accept that she's gonna lose her father. But the Prophet ﷺ said, it is about to happen. It is going to occur. So she said, that made me cry. And then when he called me close, فَبَكَيْتُ When he called me close again and he whispered in my ear again while I was crying, what he said this time, أَمَا تَرْضَيْنَا أَن تَكُونِي سَيِّذَةَ النِّسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ In one narration, he said to her that, are you not pleased with the fact that you will be made the leader of all the women in paradise? All the believing women. In another narration, he further says to her that you will be the first of my family to come and join me in the afterlife. Which basically is him saying, don't worry, we'll all be together very, very soon, once again. We'll all be reunited in the afterlife very, very soon. And she said that made me smile through my tears that we would all be together again soon. And that was the conversation she had with the Prophet ﷺ. And that essentially was that Sunday evening of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the last evening of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. With that, inshallah, it's time for prayer. So we'll conclude here uh, for today, the session. And then inshallah, we'll continue on about what transpired throughout that night into the following morning. And then we'll proceed from there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability uh, to practice everything we should have heard. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the life of the Prophet ﷺ a source of profound benefit for each and every single one of us. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.